Hello, socios. It's time for a brand new big interview. We make these just for you lovely people. This month, it's Jermaine Defoe. And honestly, believe me, you're going to enjoy listening to this. Objectively, I believe it's one of the best big interviews we've recorded. Jermaine has played successfully for West Ham, Bournemouth, Sunderland, England and Spurs, where the fans remember him so fondly that they still sing his name, even if he's playing or scoring against them. I adore the player he's become, that goal scorer that I've watched live and at times written about, and I found it interesting to discover the journey it's taken him to become the player he is today. During our podcast, Jermaine explains to me that it was never in doubt, even when he was a young boy, smashing up the house and constructing goal mouths out of the furniture in his flat, that he was destined to become a professional footballer. Providence is a key theme in this big interview, from scoring five goals for Spurs against Wigan and then repeating precisely that feat exactly one year later in a bounce match he didn't want to play in but which restored his faith in his game to the heartwarming bond that he shared with young Sunderland fan Bradley Lowry. I found that part inspirational. Jermaine discusses openly how he's been guided through life and his career. All in all, I think this is a fun, captivating and at times emotional interview. Socios, I commend to you Jermaine Defoe. Once in the past, you talked to me yourself as a kid. Not only did you love the ball and smash the house, but you kind of built little goals for yourself. Yeah. And even as a toddler learning to run and kick, it was about scoring goals. Where did that surge from? I don't know where it came from, to be honest. I've always said from day one, having a gift from God and, and just, I remember the things I used to do, was, it, it wasn't like anyone said like, you know, you need to do this or you need to do that. It was something that was natural. It was something that I used to do, just growing up, just being around the house. And I used to just sort of like make a little goal, whether it's a chair or, or anything that's got that little space. And I used to throw the ball off the wall and volley it in between the post of the chair, the city or whatever it was. And concentrating on the connection of the volley with both feet, directing it to where I wanted it to go. And I think doing that at a really young age probably helped me when I play for the school team mm -hmm. and I'm playing in games where the goals are bigger. Mm -hmm. I play for my district. So it almost became like natural. It was like it was easy because I've practiced so much before finishing into a small goal. So when I got on a big pitch with big goals, it just seemed easy. There's the essence of football. Yeah. If you make it difficult and you practice in a difficult way all the time when it comes to the real thing. Yeah. And people often say that about the Barca Madrid players, Spain players that I've been near for 15 years that yeah. because they practice in tight spaces, once you give them the pitch, yeah, exactly. it, it looks fantastic but let's be honest it's nice saying that looking back from a distance after a brilliant career but when you're a kid breaking things in the house I guess it isn't easy for your parents to say oh, okay it doesn't matter yeah. about the lampshade or, or did you never miss anything never break anything I smash everything <laughs> My nan used to go mad, but I mean, as a kid, I had so much love around me. My mum had me when she was 18, so I think they knew how much football meant to me at such a young age. So it was almost like, yeah, tell him off on that. But at the same time, he's doing what he loves to do. Mm. And at the same time, I'm doing it in the house. I'm not on the streets. Even when my nan used to moan at me, I think, right, let me just try and find another space in the house where I could do it and that. But it was literally every day. Just practice, practice, practice. Did you yeah. challenge yourself for that? Can I score 20 times yeah, before I get yeah, you know, but, sent to bed? But, but even, even doing it with both feet, I don't think anyone said to me, oh, do you know what? Like I say to kids now, when I meet kids and I, you know, I speak to them and I say, yeah, but you've got patches with both feet, it's important. And, and, and a lot of the time they don't actually realise the importance of it. But mm -hmm. when I was young, I always thought, you know what, I need to do it with both feet. I want to be good with both feet. You knew that in I knew instinctively. that from, from day one. I knew that from day one, I knew. And then when I started playing for my first team, I was eight and I played for Simra. And even then when I stayed behind after training, I always thought, right, I've got to shoot with both feet because it's important. I don't want to just be one footed and get into situations in the game where it's on my left foot. Mm -hmm. And I don't feel comfortable to finish. And it's something that I did throughout my career, really. You know, you have the full range of every kind of finish. Distance, medium, left foot, right foot, yeah. instinctive. A striker who can handle having time to finish. I should do everything. I don't know, I remember at my auntie's house, you know when you get those, um, the children, the slides? Yeah, yeah. So it goes up like this and there's a little gap there's in little between. Gap, yeah. So what I'd do is I'd get like something and pull it. If the gap's here, I'd put something here. And what I'd do is I'd throw it off the wall and I'd do like a, a little dink into the gap. So it was all sorts of finishes, but it's only because I'm talking about it now, I actually remember. But again, no one ever said to me, right, you need to do this. It weren't like, because obviously my mum and dad split up when I was two, so it was just my mum. It weren't like my mum said, oh, you got to do this, because she didn't understand. Even though my mum's brothers, my uncles play football, my mum just supported me, but it was something that I just had inside me, that I just did. It was natural. You've said two things, my mum supported me and I grew up surrounded by love. Yeah. You don't hear that a lot, either in society or in, in football. It's, it's a beautiful thing to have had. Yeah. It's a nice thing to say, but it changes you as a human being, what circumstances you grow up in. Of course, yeah. Because I'm used to footballers saying, I had nothing. 
I was treated yeah. badly yeah. or life was grim and this yeah. was my only way out. It was tough because obviously I grew up in, in East London, working class background. My nan worked in a, in a sugar factory. My granddad worked in a meat factory and sort of like just, I suppose, working around the clock really. Mm-hmm. My mum was one of six. My mum was pregnant at 17, had me at 18. Mm-hmm. And it was tough because it, even when my mum left my nan and granddad's house, it was just me and my mum like in a block of flat in Stratford in East London, mm-hmm. working around the clock just to provide food and just to buy me like my football kits and my boots and stuff like that. So all these sort of things, I remember everything. So even to this day, when people say, yeah, but what motivates you? And you get different characters, the lads that, I don't know, that are married, they might say, oh, my wife or my kids motivate yeah. me or certain situations that they've been through in their lives and that. But I've always think about, you know, growing up in that sort of environment where I remember seeing like my nan and granddad working hard, grafting, my mum grafting and stuff like that. So I think because I was in that sort of environment where it was tough for them, mm-hmm. but it worked hard. Mm-hmm. no matter what so I think just being in that environment the thing that still motivates me and just, just keeps me going and just keeps me working hard two interviews ago it was Ledley King so he sat down and obviously yeah. <laughs> there are many similarities in the things that I'm hearing that you said but Ledley talked about the cage he, he played in the cage it's just up the road for me yeah where the cage was sometimes full of 10 people too many so yeah. it was a forest of bodies and he said so what you learned was when the ball comes that's a valuable moment because it ain't coming to you that often keep and therefore it, yeah. keep it or learn how to use it well and but he, he, he said his mum was on a balcony overlooking the cage and it was a really big deal to her to be able to watch where he was. Because these areas, without dramatising it, there were other paths to follow if you're not careful. Of course. Well, put it this way, one of my friends who I grew up with, he was a really good player mm. um, and probably should have gone on to play in the Premier League and stuff like that. He's, he's in prison. Mm. Uh, it looks like he's like a life sentence. And a lot of my other friends you know, who I played with you know, end up in prison and stuff like that. So... Yeah, it, it, it could have been completely different. I understand that. My life could have been completely different if it weren't for my mum. I don't know, just stressing the importance of like working hard, you know, being disciplined. If she says to me, well, if you're telling me this is what you want to do and that's your passion, mm-hmm. I'll support you, but you've got to give it 100%. I don't expect you to come to me and say, mum, I want to be out on the streets yeah. smoking and drinking in the cage, because we had a cage as well. When I lived on the estate, we moved to the second house. Mm-hmm. I don't want to see you be doing that because at the end of the day, if this is what you're telling me, mm-hmm. this is what you want to achieve in life, then you can't be doing that. You can't be drinking. You have to be different from the rest. That's how it was with me. And that discipline with her, apart from loving her son and protecting her son, did that come from either, you know, they're right and wrong because of religious beliefs or right and wrong because how your, your nan and your granddad had taught her? That rigid vision of there's a right way forward. If you want to do this, I'll give you everything, but you must give me back. Where did that rule come from in her mind? I think both. Obviously, Christian background. I just think both, to be honest. I think... It's always difficult for parents, especially, I mean, she had me when she was 18. Mm-hmm. Um, still a kid, really. Yeah. To have that sort of like responsibility. So you grew up fast. My nan and granddad were quite strict. Even though my mum was the youngest out of the six. Um, the but youngest, she maybe but, might have been spoiled because of being the youngest. Massively. The but a real strong character. I mean, I call my mum Oprah Winfrey. That's what I call her. <laughs> because that's who she reminds me of, because she's such a strong woman. Mm-hmm. And a lot of my friends... And family members, because I've got a big family, who sometimes they might have problems and stuff like that and they don't really want to, they don't feel comfortable talking to people, so they'll go to my mum. And that's my friends as well. So that's the sort of character she is. It's a huge position of respect. Of course, yeah. So, I mean, for me, it was sort of like, that's how she was with me. It was tough. There was times, obviously, as a kid, you want to be out with your friends. It's natural. You know? Yeah, but my mum was like, no, you've got to be home. You've got to be disciplined. You've got to eat well. You've got to go to bed early. You've got training tomorrow. It's important that you do well at school. All these sort of things. That's how she was. Was there any point when you were younger when the cost of a ball is difficult? You wouldn't easily lose a football or burst a football, would you? No, you wouldn't. And even the levers coming off and stuff like that, you sort of like peel it off and just get on with it. And even your first pair of boots and stuff like that, how I was saying to the lads today, how you get that first pair of boots and that night you sort of like get the dubbing and you what yeah. hot water and all these memories, man. It's just it's amazing because you never forget things like that. You don't take you don't take anything for granted and that because you you know where you've come from and how hard it was for your family and stuff like that. And then years later you're in a position where you're you get given boots and you get everything you want everything really. But at the same time it's always important to remember where you come from. You say that somebody will gift you something or you you get chauffeur driven around because a television company wants you and you go like instantly you go, Oh, this is nice. Yeah, of course. And it can change you. It can envelop you and change you without it can change even you, yeah. noticing. Without even noticing. And that's yeah. why it's important to have the people around you. Because a lot of times you can people say that you're in the situations and you could be blinded. You you might not mm-hmm. see. Like you said, it could change you and you might not even realise but then you've got people around you and say, hold on a minute, just, you know what I mean, just, just chill out a little bit. Saying, Rab, um, it keeps coming up time and time again. You wouldn't have been an exact cohort of Ledley, would you? Or Ledley, you? Ledley's like, uh, was two years up. I was going to say, you remember the noise and the huge number of pitches and the terrible state some of the dressing rooms were in. 
that Senrab was vital for him. And he also said that when he saw John Terry, even at that age, it was just instant impact about the ferocity, what he would do on the pitch to win in sporting as yeah. well as in competitive terms. Give me the things that, that surge up from your memory now that we've walked in that My memory. Up. days. Yeah. Arriving at Wednesday Flats, smelling like the that, that football smell it was like vapour rub. Winter green. Yeah. yeah. Right. I used to smell that and I used to, I used to love it. It was just like, okay, it's football time because that's all I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. That's all I wanted to do. That's all I was interested in. Didn't care about anything else. And then I think we'd actually turn up in our kits, jump out your mum and dad's car, get in the change, put your boots on and it was just the best thing in the world. You know, in the morning, I couldn't, I couldn't even eat my breakfast. I was so excited. Yes. But even then, I'm talking about when I was eight, nine, all about goals, all about goals. I, I, I want to score goals. I want to score goals. You know, if I scored three, I wanted to score four. If I scored four, I wanted to score five. And that's just just that that fire in my belly that I had from, from day one, where just that buzz of scoring goals on a Sunday morning was just so important to me. Because even then, because you're a goal scorer, were well, you treated differently? Because no matter how we want to talk about football and the beauty of creation or playing out from the back now or the cleverness of an Iniesta, it doesn't matter how you want a garland football and great thinker it's about goals goals win games goals win games it's as simple as that we yeah. all wanted to be a striker Sergio Busquets says to me the only thing that disappoints me in my career is I want to score goals yeah. because goals are the most beautiful that everybody yeah. wants you to even, score but even like um, you, get, you get people that have achieved a lot in their lives I don't know singers and stuff like that the One Direction guys like if you had a choice what would you be? Oh, I wanted to be a footballer Football. and score a goal <laughs> it's crazy you know yeah for me it was just like I don't know it was just even before the games, watching videos of Ian Wright, you know, in my room and stuff like that. And then just, ex- just can't wait for my next game, can't wait for my next game. I'm going to emulate the players I've seen on TV. I just want to score goals. Hoping one day, you know, I can go on and, and score, even if it's that one goal in the Premier League or even if it's that one goal for England and stuff like that. And, you know, from the Simrab days and just lead it. Did like, you visualise what you'd like to do? Did you have it in your mind, like... When you know you're dreaming at night, or you're thinking about the game four days away, I knew, I knew. But even like, if I say it to people, I knew I was going to be a footballer. That's me just being totally honest. It's how I felt and my mindset from day one, and what I used to say to people. Because if you spoke to any of my family members, my aunties, my uncles, my mum, I knew from I knew that there was nothing that was going to stop me from going on to become a professional and, and, and score goals in the Premier League and score goals in my country. I just knew from day one. There's lots of addictions in football. Do you think? Goal scoring can become an addiction. It's a great addiction. Ian Wright says it all the time, and people say, "But what did, what did it feel like on that day when you scored?" You can't you can't explain it. Uh, you can't explain. You can't actually get the word. You can't explain it. You can try, uh-huh. but you, 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 you can't explain. You've it. helped me there because you stopped me making a fool of myself. Because yeah. all throughout my career, yeah. because you know I played at amateur level and any yeah. kind of I played football and hockey, and it, beating the goalkeeper, putting the ball past somebody, scoring, lifting your team. The timing of where's the ball coming to it, even for an idiot like me, it's the best. I, I could talk for a day about that one question. Yeah, you might not get it right, but it, it brings out all kinds of emotions. So, like, without saying it's just this phrase, what you've used it when you, you talked about having to lie in a nice bath in order to be ready and prepare, and it's not very good. But my reward is, I know that feeling a goal gives me. Yeah, exactly. Talk so about I, it then. What the preparation beforehand? No, that that, that goal feeling. If it's not just the moment, talk it's, about goals, professional scoring, professional high-level goals for Spurs, West Ham, and Toronto, and England, and scoring and scoring and scoring and scoring. Well, I mean, it's it's like I remember when I scored the the volley uh, for Sunderland against Newcastle, and in my celebrations, I cried when I scored, and then and then people said like, oh, why did you cry when you scored that goal?" So I don't know, because that's how much it means to me. Like some people just, everyone's different. You can scream and all that sort of stuff. But because I wanted to do it so badly in that game, the emotion and just everything, when, when I scored, even if it was a tap-in, I still think I would have, you know what I mean? It would have brought tears to my eyes. And it's happened to me a few times in games, to be honest. I remember when I scored the fifth against Wigan, I got emotional because this is how much it means to me. This, like, this is something that's been like, from Simrab day, this is all I wanted to do from day one. And that feeling I get inside me, it's just, it's just the best feeling in the world. And, and I've always said you've got to embrace it because you know that day when you sort of like when you finish playing, phew, you're gonna miss that. Do you know what I mean? So much. In how many instances are you aware of the crowd or the keeper beating his fist in the ground or your teammates celebrating before they've reached you, or is it just a total zone out for it's 15, totally, 20 seconds? Or yes, it's a, it's a zone out because, especially with me, because before games I always try and visualise me scoring goals and stuff like that. So it's almost like when I do it, I'm not surprised. 
I'm not surprised because I've played it in my mind so much. I've played it over and over in my mind all week in training, you know, and, and doing my finishing in training and then you get into the same position and you finish. So, I mean, you shouldn't be surprised because you've, you've rehearsed it so much. You should be confident you're going to go out there on a the weekend and you're just going to make it happen. So it's almost like, but just that, that buzz, knowing that, you know what, you've worked so hard on that and got the opportunity and then bang, and you've taken it. And then that's when you sort of like, that's when you recognise, the, the, you know, the, like the crowd and the fans and stuff. You just feel so important. And um, not only the, the fans, but your, 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 your fellow teammates. Mm-hmm. You know, you've helped your teammates, mm-hmm. you've helped your team and your club. And it's, it's, a, it's, such a, it's such a big thing. It's a massive thing and it's just the, the best feeling. I think we can recognise, or at least it feels to me that I often criticise, particularly colleagues in the media, something will happen on a football pitch and it'll maybe land in a disciplinary. And the mode these days is to hammer and it's, it's unbelievable. How could they do that? Now, for, say, for example... Cristiano Ronaldo this year in the Super Cup plays against Barcelona, comes along, scores a goal in the 3-1 away win at the Camp Nou for the first leg of the Super Cup. It's a very, very good goal. And he scored at the Camp Nou. And um, he strips off his jersey and, it's, yeah, yeah, like, exactly. and you can count the muscles. And it's, yeah, yeah. You know, it's a horrible picture. I don't think a man should look like that personally. <laughs> but he then gets fouled by Umtiti and it is a penalty and the referee doesn't give it. And he does something stupid. He gets second booking, sent off, pushes the referee, blah, blah, blah. But it all stems back to that taking the jersey off because if you don't get booked, the second booking isn't a sending off. You don't push the referee and it just is a bad day at the office, not a yeah, six-game yeah, ban. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That taking the jersey off, it's like in that moment, I'm not defending him specifically, I've always thought players who score goals when they go and gesture to their opposition fans or they stick it up yeah, to yeah. the other it's like, you're not, it's like you're not in control of what you're doing. That's what I feel. It's like you're not in control of what you're doing for that, I don't know, however long it is. Five seconds where you, you scored and it's just like, bang, you just, do you know what I mean? You're not really in control of what you're doing. So the fact that he took his jersey off is because he's so excited and it means so much to him. He's pumped. Can you imagine? You, you take your jersey off. Fair enough. You know, you, you, the rules say you're not allowed to do it anymore. No, but you're not thinking. But you're not thinking. No. Because he's, done, he's just done something so mm. special and he knows that. The emotion of the game, like... But the rule said you're not allowed to do it. But really, is it a big thing? No, it's not. No, it's not. No, it's Have you got not. any celebrations in that moment that you're really proud of, that you laugh at or that you remember? Or I don't think you always celebrated identically. You didn't have an out-and-out trademark. No, no, no. Always different. It's always got to be, di- it's always got to be different. I remember when I was younger and I'd done a, a, a couple... I remember I'd done a documentary and I did this one. I was at Tottenham. Remember that song, that song Usher, Let It Burn? I did, <clears> this, I did this thing in that. I saw it recently. It was funny. But I like that, though, because you know sometimes when you've planned something... I planned the celebration all week, so I was like, okay, if you're planning, you better score against Burnley, and it was a nice goal, and I did it and that, but because I planned it, I think that fried me up even more, and I think I have to score, just waiting for the chance, and then bang, you score, so it's nice and that, but I understand the game's changed a lot now, there's so many rules and stuff like that, but at the same time, I mean, I think people do understand that when you do score a goal, it's sort of like, you know, you just, you go mad and you do things perhaps you shouldn't do, but... It's just part and parcel, isn't it? Before I move on to another subject, we've got lots of questions. We've got you know a lot of people who join us and become member socios. So let me mention Alan Horan. Of all the managers you've played under, and this might link to my next section anyway, who's had the biggest influence in your career? The biggest influence? Of any manager, any coach. I'll say Harry Redknapp. Yeah? Because from day one, I mean, when I was 15, Harry uh, apparently said to some of the scouts at West Ham, um, there's this young kid I want, go and get him. And it was as simple as that, go and get him. You know, this is, this is who I want. Mm-hmm. And uh, it just made it happen. 16, signed for West Ham. So you were then at Charlton? I was at Charlton first. Yeah. And then he wanted me. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was at a place called Lillyshaw. don't know if you remember. Wow, the centre for, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was at Lillyshaw for two years. Because yeah. that was a, let's, for those who don't have so that, that, that was a hard place to get into because it was a centre for excellence. Centre for excellence, like um, the best 16 boys in England. I mean, when I went to the first trial, it was that 2,000 boys at the first trial, and they narrowed it down to the 16. You weren't intimidated? Um, I wasn't intimidated because the last two days, when there was like 200 boys, you go to Lillyshaw and you play two games, and that's it. The first day you play 11 v 11. The next day you play 11 v 11. The first game I scored five, and the second game I scored five. So it was almost like I'm waiting for my letter sort of thing. <laughs> yeah, so when my letter came, I was, I was delighted. Obviously, it was the, it was the, at that time, it was the, the best thing that ever happened to me, but I knew because... I, Obviously, I produced in the games, as simple yeah. as that, and I, yeah. I was ready for it. I was confident. I was always confident growing up anyway. Um, I, I always believed in myself. I always believed in my ability, um, and I knew I could score goals, and I felt like I could, sc- I could score goals at any level. So, yeah, so when I did that, and I went to Liverpool for two years, and then that's when sort of like Harry thought, 
we need this kid and that. Now, signed from West Ham at 16, and it was just the best thing ever again because, right, now now this is this is where it really starts because that football environment where you're training every day, it's every man to their souls, really. You've got to get yourself... You're in the youth team, but the, the main aim is to get yourself in the first team. Mm-hmm. And the first day I signed, I walked in, who was the first person I saw? Ian Wright, who was my idol. Mm-hmm. Um, then I saw Rio Ferdinand. Then I saw, saw like, Michael and Joe. Um, Joe was at Lily Shaw with me. It was a year... Yeah, right, yeah, it was my senior. Mm-hmm. When I walked in, I just felt like, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm at the right place. Mm-hmm. Um, a year after they won the Youth Cup, I just knew I had that good feeling. Um, a year later, I made my debut. So it was... Harry's been part of this interview series Yeah. Um, on the coast in his beautiful house with the Pilates Club going on and Barney the dog barking in the, in the background and a 17-foot TV screen with the races going on over my shoulder. And yeah. these things about Harry that, that we adore, and I think he's a funny, characterful man, and I keep writing about how when he's not in English football anymore, everybody will suddenly go, bloody hell, we miss him, and we miss people like him. But yeah. what that masks, I think, is that he's always had a trust in talented, creative footballers. He's always said... That's the brand of football I want. And he's, yeah. okay, in your case, he trusted you, he picked you, and then he promoted you. And that, that I'm saying something true about Harry, am I? That yeah. it, it's not about the, the buying and selling or no. the, 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 the fact that he's a brilliant raconteur of funny no. anecdotes. He's got it's a brilliant that. football brain and he trusts talent. Yeah, it's just that satisfaction I think he gets from producing players and players that go on to represent their country as well because, mm. you know, the likes of me. Joe Cole, Michael Carrick, Rio Ferdinand, even Glenn Johnson, really, from 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 when he came to the football club when he was young. So it was just like, uh, I mean, it's just just amazing, really, because, and even after that, you know, the boys always used to. There was this thing in the change rooms, this joke, you know. Um, they used to say, "That's my dad. That's your dad in football." Harry because went, he yeah, was a yeah, bit. because every club he went to, he'd, he'd want me. <laughs> and the thing with Harry as well, that was, I mean, for me, that was. Amazing is the the confidence that he used to give you because he never with me he never really used to complicate anything. All he used to say to me is, "Just go and score goals," and that was it. Go and go and do what you do. Go and score goals, and that was it. You know, if he wanted me to come to another club, I'd speak to him. Just come here and score goals. Just do what you do, and that was it. I was like, "Wow!" Didn't complicate anything. Didn't you know? Go and score goals. I know you can do it. Just go and express yourself and go and score goals. And he's telling you he trusts you and he's that's, giving you responsibility. A quickie before we move on in that case, I think you've already touched on it. When you were growing up, who were the players that stood out to you and did you model your game around any of them? And that's from Adam Morgan. Ian Wright. For many reasons. Obviously, the obvious one is the goals and stuff like that. But I think for someone to come into the game so late and to to score those many goals that he did for Arsenal, break the record, obviously, before Thierry come along. A unique story, mm-hmm. a real special story, you know. Um, I mean, he was a painter, a decorator, mm-hmm. you know, had a job and, and he was happy doing that. Then he just went to a trial at Palace, quite relaxed about it, ended up getting a contract, you know, scored two goals in a cup final against Man United and then bang, went to Arsenal and then the rest is history. You know, the celebrations. I was going to say, the, did the, you like the, the fact the, that he also had a bit of style the and passion? And one wit. of those, yeah, and, and right, obviously, a bit of the old school where that old school mentality is. Put a contract there, I'll just sign it. I don't even need to look because for me, the, mo- the most important thing is scoring goals. The money side of all the other side that takes care of itself, that's not important to me. Just just let me play football. This is what I love doing. And for me, it was just like studying that tape and DVD, just sitting in my room at night, just watching it, just watching a, all different types of finishing, left foot, right foot, you know, little dinks over the goalkeeper, clever finishing, movement, everything. If ever you need reaffirmation of a Christian belief, you have all those dreams, you're a little bit inspired by him, you look to copy him and you've, you come in the door and... For State West Ham, and yeah, who's that, there? It's not coincidence. These things <laughs> I don't are just, think so. Yeah, it's part of your story. This, these things are just meant to happen. It's, uh, it's definitely not a coincidence, not at all. You're talented enough to make that young debut at West Ham, but Harry's smart enough to, to put you down to a club, something like this. Yeah. You come to Bournemouth. I don't know, was there a single player who stood out when you got here? You know, naming no names, blonde hair to fit. So you yeah, come right. down here. I mean, talk about things being meant. Tell people, because not everybody knows your story and Eddie Howe's story. You come yeah. down here and you play with Eddie Howe, right? Yeah, Eddie was the captain, you know, centre-half with Jason Tindall, who's the assistant manager here, who I actually lived with. When you came down? When I came down. OK. Now, Jason's dad, who's the one that scouted me at West Ham, was a young kid. He used to take me to train him, just pick me up. So, again, another unique story, really, and how, you know, a full circle. And I'm back here, you know, I played with a manager. I played with the assistant manager. I played with Perchie, who was the, the full-back, Big Fletch, who's still here. Husey, who's still at the club. 
so many of the others. So it's uh, yeah, it was crazy. But back then, if I could look at any of those players and thought, you know, one of you would probably go on to be a manager, it would have been Eddie because he was always sort of like composed and calm, you know, good player, good defender, solid, strong, give everything, mm-hmm. consistent, you know, but just like a natural leader, really. What defines that for you? I mean, maybe it's just automatic. You see it and you can't explain it, but when you say a natural leader, it's not always about shouting. For me, it's not even about shouting because, no. I mean, with England, play played with Steven Gerrard. Yeah. He was captain. Mm-hmm. Never ever screamed and shouted. He never used to shout in the dressing room. He was quite relaxed. But as soon as you walk across that line... And something needs to be said or someone that needs to lead by example, especially with their performance in big games, difficult situations and that, he was always the one. He was always the one. And like I said about being composed and being calm and, and relaxed, not letting the occasion get to you. I think Eddie was like that, really. Because at the time, we were playing well, you know, pushing for the playoffs. But was always that like, consistent and that was solid. And when you look at him, he's not even that big, really. Not for a centre-half, no. No, not for a centre-half. No. But was just like, yeah, was really strong and had a, had a lot of heart. Had a lot of heart. What did the environment here do for you? Not just the club or AD, but the city, everybody listening here, where you get this around the world, they don't know Bournemouth necessarily. And this is a big change from where you grew up. It must have had some kind of impact on you when you came down here. Yeah, because obviously I grew up in East London. I was at home with my mum and my family. And then when I was at West Ham, it was just like, obviously I had to go training and I will just go home. And that was it really. Never, never really done anything else, mm-hmm. to be honest. Because all I wanted to do is just play football and just rest and and just sort of like not get distracted or anything like that. So I didn't really do anything else. Mm-hmm. Just training home, got that sort of routine. So when Harry called me into the office and said, I want to send you on loan to Bournemouth, after I made my debut at something, I scored in a cup, confident, um, still young, and he said, I want to send you on loan to Bournemouth. And I was like, Bournemouth? I'm like, where's that sort of thing? Because uh, I was so young, went home, spoke to my mum. My mum spoke to Harry on the phone. Were you a bit hurt? No, I wasn't hurt, to be honest, because I just thought, when he said to me that Rio did it, I was like, Okay then, yeah. yeah. And I trusted him, to be honest. I was like, okay. Because I know what you meant, because maybe I could have thought, well, I want to be involved in the first team. Here, you're sending me on loan. But he's basically saying to me, I don't want you to, to play reserve football. I want you to go out and get some league experience. And I mean, when I came here, I came here confident, to be honest. I came here confident. I had that, I had that belief that, you know what? Okay, cool. I'll go there and score goals. No problem. That's the sort mm-hmm. of like, mentality I had. And then like the lads here were brilliant, to be fair. Um, you know, Big Fletch looked after me because it was tough. I came here when I was playing games and I was getting smashed all over the place and that. But in a funny sort of way, when I was playing games and people were kicking me, I liked it. I liked it because I thought, okay, then. Right, it just fired me up even more. You know, this young kid from West Ham sort of thing. I was tiny and that, but like, I always worked on my sharpness. And, and even though the games were tough and stuff like that, and I just thought, right, I'm sharp and I could get my shots off. And, and if I get chances, I'll score. And scoring in 10 consecutive games was just like, I never thought I'd do that. You didn't? No, I never thought I'd score in 10 consecutive games. It's an enormous achievement, it but was, your yeah. level of confidence is yeah, such I was that confident, I might But thought. you just don't, because I didn't know about any records and stuff yeah, like no, that. Never no, once no. I started talking about records and stuff like that. And then maybe in a way it helped me. When people start talking about the record, I thought, oh, I, want, I need to do this and that. Okay. So, again, fired up even more. Going into games thinking, right, I need to score, I need to score and that. But to be fair, we, we had a good team and the team spirit was just like unbelievable. You, you're talking, I think you're talking about, like when you say smashed about, just the, you can't avoid the fact that they've just gone, well, even without knowing you, people have gone Billy big time. Yeah, of course. Small kid, come down from West Ham, down here. Yeah. And wherever you're playing, I don't know who the Div 1 opponents were then, it's like, let's give him a bit and see if he can take yeah, it. Or let's, see just, if he can let's take put it. him out of the game, even. Uh, exactly. But, I mean, maybe coming from East London, it was sort of like, I had that in me, I was tough, so it was just, didn't really bother Nobody me. intimidated you, nobody got never. to you ever, not once, not one rival no, in that never. time. Because, uh, again, in my mind, I thought, right, i just got to come here and produce in that. Because for me, the main goal was going back to West Ham, getting the first team. It made you more savvy, maybe. Um, yeah. Because Daryl Garrity here um, writes in and talks about, he calls it shift and shoot. He's never seen anybody no being able lift. to... No backlift. I remember when David Pleat, Simon at Tottenham, he said that. But, like, see, if I was doing finishing and training, I'd always want to do it, like, match tempo. I didn't want to do yeah. it so it's false, like... Because at the end of the day, uh, you, when you're training, it's got, you've got to get yourself ready for the games. So I always like to do finishes where I do it so sharp that the goalkeeper can't even react. Hmm. And again, because I was doing that for years, just practice and practice and practice. So when I started doing it in games, a lot of people used to make a big thing about it. Like, you shoot with no backlift, but um, maybe I didn't even think about it before. Mm-hmm, it's mm-hmm. just, maybe it was like just natural and that. But when people start talking about it, I was like, ah, oh. then I'd watch myself finishing I was like oh yeah that was quite sharp I did it with no backlift and that because I had that in the back of my mind so I thought right I've got to continue doing that and even get better at it you that. rewatch your own finishes to learn yeah yeah, yeah I love that yeah so Griezmann does that and, and people are going like are amazed by it but I think yeah. all great footballers review and think and, and what can I do better or what can I repeat and yeah, of one of the things that you maybe ask about is that you know we, we had a session with Kev Phillips doing this and he was fabulous because he was one of those strikers who seemed to always be able to 
put the ball where he knew that the keeper's balance meant that he was just an inch or two off balance. Yeah, yeah, and couldn't, you can, you can, yeah. Now, you do that too, because you've got such a range of finishes. Do you look at keepers? Or I can do, see he, him. You could. I don't look, but I can see him. I don't uh-huh. have to explain it. Like, I remember speaking to Dick Advocate and he said some players, some forwards, to the greats and that, even like the people like Van Basten and stuff like that, he, yeah. says, he said that some forwards have got this thing where that even I've got my head down, but I can see the mm. goalkeeper. I can see a slight movement where I might change my mind, but I can see it, but I'm not looking at him. It's in the back but of your I mind feel somewhere. It. Yeah, I could feel it. Even when I watch other sports, for instance, I love Floyd Mayweather. Floyd, why did you do this? He said, I don't know why I did it, but I can just feel it. I just know when they're going to jab. Because I always watch him and I think, how can you counter punch? I always think, you must know when someone's going to punch you. <laughs> and I just think, that's crazy. So basically, that's like, Okay, I'm going to wait for you to punch me, and you might connect. I'm going to wait for you to throw your punch, and I'm going to counter it. I feel so. sometimes with him, it's like, there's almost like an offer. But he, so if you but, offer, then they'll go, yeah, and then yeah, you but, counter. He said, but then he says, I can just feel it. I can't explain it, but I can just feel it. It's phenomenal. Yeah, you don't what a gift. You see it. Because even sometimes I've, I've taken penalties, and then I've run up, and I'll score. Then I'll be like, and then I'll say to myself, I saw, the guy, I, I saw something. I see him move a little bit. I saw him lean a little bit, or his legs, or his feet, or whatever it is. And I'm not looking, but I don't know. It's just it's, it's weird. Where have you found the most satisfaction? Because you, you've done great things, you've achieved great things, and you've become, I think, respected and adored, and you've consistently scored goals, such that, for example, at Spurs, you know, they're all time leading European goal scorer, which is extraordinary. You're ahead of Teddy Shearing, and other lists and whatever probably don't make you that excited. But where have you found that combination of complete personal satisfaction, achievement? I'm at my peak, this is heaven. Where is the moment in your football life? Because I spent a long time at Tottenham, to be honest. And, uh, yeah, I remember that. I remember the season where Harry was the manager. It was 2010, the World Cup season. I was so fired up because I wanted to go to the World Cup so bad. I was like... Because you should have gone. I should have gone. Yeah. I, that's what I felt in my heart. I should have gone. So I thought, no. right, this is my season. Mm. I'm on it. This is my season. Started the season well. I scored the five goals against Wigan. And I think that season, it was just like, I was just in another place, to be honest. I mean, mentally, physically, you know... I was at my sharpest, I was confident. In my eyes, I was playing under the best manager. And I was in the England squad, I was scoring for England. And I just thought, yeah, it looks like I'm going to go to the World Cup. But I think that season, it was amazing. You know, I was in an amazing place. You've answered Michael Shannon's question, what was it like scoring five in the second half against Wigan? And talk about that 9-1 win in general, which on that day, you must have felt pretty much invincible, I guess. But given that you'd scored five twice to get to Lillishall, it's... You could, you could do a little, yeah, done it before. To yeah, but even like we want. spoke about Christian, those stuff like that, like things are meant to happen because cause I love football. Mm-hmm. So I know stats and stuff. And um, when I scored the five goals against Wigan, mm-hmm. and I knew at that moment that it was only Alan Shearer and Andy Cole that had done it. You'd never done that in Premier League I knew history. that I was the only players to do it in, the, in, in one half. And it, it was crazy. But I remember a year later, a year to that day, I remember I got injured and I couldn't get back into the team. Mm-hmm. And then Harry pulled me in the morning and said, oh, you're playing in the training ground game against the Leighton Orient. I was like, nah, I don't want to play in this game. What do you know what I mean? I want to get back into the team. I don't want to be playing games at the training ground. I remember getting on the phone to my mum. Like, I was quite upset and stuff like that. She said, at the end of the day, just do it for yourself. Keep yourself sharp and fit so when you get an opportunity, you're ready to go. Mm-hmm. I said to myself, you know what? No problem. Played the game, scored five. <laughs> right? <laughs> I remember there's all like scouts and stuff and then I scored five and then let's go and I give it one of them or oh, Harry, come on, that's enough, come off. And people were clapping on the side and that. I was so fired up because I was upset because I didn't yeah, want to play. Yeah, but yeah. I thought, okay then, I'm going to show you sort of thing that I shouldn't be playing in these games. I scored five. When the change rooms and it was on Sky Sports News. Do you mean I scored five goals in a game at the training ground? And a year ago, he scored... A, a year to the day. Yeah, to the day. He scored five goals against Wigan. And I was just sort of like, I thought, it's just, how weird is that? It's just, it's crazy. But it was like, um, all these things, I'll never forget that because... It's just, yeah, it's just, it's mad. Well, Ben Cropper said how big a role has religion played in your career. Mm. And I think it's interesting that, I think if you concentrate and you look at things that are strange in your life, and particularly if you've been, if you put effort in and you've worked for things, some of the weird things begin to have a pattern, I think. Yeah, it does have, yeah, it does have a pattern. Loads of things, to be honest. And it's, like I said before, it's not like coincidence or, I mean, obviously when you've got faith in that, it's, it's a massive part. And that's how you think, really. I mean, I mentioned at the beginning when we first started about, you know, having a gift and stuff like that. My mum used to say to me from day one, you've got a gift from God. You have to go and express yourself. Use the gift that you've got. Mm. And it's, it's just as simple as that. And she still says that now. And that's why I never worry about stuff. Because even when I'm, even if you go through a spell where, Maybe you're not scoring or you're not playing how you normally play. Mm-hmm. Then I always say to myself, but you know what? At the end of the day, 
I've got a gift that no one can take that away from me. And I've done it before and it's just a matter of time before I do it again. Mm. So I'll never panic. Mm. I never panic or get tensed or, or lose confidence because I think, do you know what I mean? If there's a purpose or that something's a, there's, happening. There's a purpose, like... there's a purpose. And it's, maybe it's a negative, but you know, you've got to try and turn that negative situation into a positive situation and just think, well, I just believe it's, it's a matter of time. Just keep doing what you've always done and then hoping that it would change. I'm going to break away from my template here a little bit because it's always struck me that if you're... You know, if you believe, if you have faith, and you're, and you're not only willing to um, talk about it, but professional football is a hard, sometimes mean, often treacherous profession. I've always imagined that even on the pitch, there are situations where you might not have to do somebody, but it, it can be very cutthroat sometimes at the top level. There must have arrived moments when your faith as you choose to interpret it, yeah, yeah. and life as a professional footballer, aren't it's very different. compatible. It's not compatible because, yeah, you can be sort of like a Christian or whatever it is and then your football is like that football environment, you know, the things that go on in the change rooms, you know, after a game when you've won that sort of like image of players going to sort of like to a nightclub, you yeah. know, people, all these sort of things. But whoever said it's easy being a Christian, you know, people make mistakes and it's, it's, I think it's recognising your mistakes mm -hmm. and, and learning from them and just trying to be the best person you can, you, you can be and I think that's all you can do really. And... I understand the question, but I just feel like if you're sort of like um, honest with yourself and, and you try your best, that's all. That's all you can do. That's all you can. That's I think that's a fair do. answer. I think that's. Yeah. I think that's a, a helpful answer for people who yeah. might not have your strength, but are trying to find their way. Yeah. Um, because if you have your conversations with God, yeah, each of ours are private. Yeah. But then you do your your best. But they say though, they say God can. God only sees your heart. See, with me, like if I've made a mistake, but I know in my heart that. Um, I, I didn't mean to if I've hurt someone but I know deep down in my heart I didn't mean to hurt that person I just believe that God sees that mm -hmm. he sees that and says you know what he didn't mean to do that and I've got, and I've got a conscience and it will hurt me mm -hmm. I've hurt someone else I just believe that God sees that I thought it was extraordinary uh, we're here because we've enjoyed your career literally I often say like if I'm not at the game or if I'm not working in England who will I turn on the television to watch you're one of them and there are a variety of reasons for that but if you watch often, and I worked here, I saw you play, I've seen you play live and I've reported on you many times, but one of the rewards is this extraordinary thing is when you left Spurs, the Spurs fans would still sing about you. Yeah. And uh, I've even heard them on television singing for yeah. you yeah. when you're playing against them. They did it the other week. <laughs> no, I didn't know that. At Wembley, well, yeah. What, what, what's that? I don't think I can really, like, when, when they're doing it, but I'm playing for another team, like, because when I came on, like it, my friends that were at the game, they said, you know, you've got a stand ovation and that. And I was like, I was aware of it, but I'm so, like, I'm in a zone because I'm, I'm, I've come on and I'm trying, to, I'm trying to score for my team. Yeah. But it's not until after the game I sit down and think, oh, wow, that's special and that. But it's just, again, I don't know, it's just one of those things. That, like, it's such an amazing feeling to sort of like, to still get that sort of love from the Spurs fans. It's mental and I just, it's just, it's crazy. It isn't, because it isn't just there's an ex, there's one of ours. Because often, mm. exes can be booed, or why did you leave, yeah, exactly, or yeah. blah, 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 or yeah. we're going to give you a hard time today and then we'll still love you in our hearts after. But to sort of go against the tribal nature of football yeah. and to cheer an opponent, it, yeah. you know, if you were retiring, if it was your last ever game against them, yeah. you can see it. It's all the time. It's all the time, yeah. What have uh, you done to, you, apart from being an honest player who scored goals, yeah. What have you done? But you for me, it's still hard to understand it, to be honest. Oh, really? Yeah, it's still hard to understand it because I'm like, I mean, since me, there's been so many players that have come and gone and, and, and are still there doing well and stuff like that. And they still sort of like appreciate what I did at the club and, you know, the goals and stuff like that. But maybe it's more than the goals because I always, I always felt like I had a special relationship with the Tottenham fans. Um, and even when there was times where, I don't know, maybe you come out from injury, you're not firing as, always used to sing my name, always sung my name because... Every time I put that shirt on, I always gave 100%. Always gave 100%. And I think I knew how... Every time I put the shirt on, I knew that I was playing for a special football club. Can I ask you, do you think it's that you are them? 100%. Because everybody loves talent. Everybody loves winning. Everybody loves a goal scorer. But I think anybody who's got any brain who loves football can see somebody who does exactly you what we it. would do if, if we were on there. And a, yeah, of course. I think that's the special thing, yeah, is and that's my what, opinion. And that's exactly what Wright he had with the Arsenal fans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And to this yeah, yeah, day yeah. still. So it's like a um, special connection. Yeah, like you said, not all players would get that. But you've seen the players that, that get that and it's, 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 it, is, it is special. You know, because you weren't expecting the length of this, I want, I want to tie this. I, I, I promise you. You could be pinned to the wall for another six hours on this. 
<laughs> had you not thought this was a 10-minute interview because, you know, this is pure joy. This is second only to porting or playing. Yeah. You know, so in a, a yeah. podium position for us and for those who listen, yeah. this is exceptional. This is special. Yeah. And it breaks down the myth of the thing you touched on Premier League footballers are rich and feckless and they don't care and all they do is club and that. Yeah. So that's our, the whole purpose of this series is to say football is glorious, footballers can be special, interesting people. Yeah. So the, the slightly difficult subject, you went through a period in your life, you've had disappointments to deal with in your career, but you went through a period in your life where you lost a lot of people that were close to you, that were important to you. You've talked in a really interesting way that I think will be useful to people in their daily lives in that... Yeah. You talked about being a stronger person for bereavement and grief. Yeah. And there was one, I think, pretty extraordinary phrase about having coped with it. There were people around you in dressing rooms who talk about death and are scared about death. You've had to deal with that and, and, yeah. and, and grief is a thing that you need to not carry around with you. How would you describe what that's done to you, how, how you coped with it and how, and well, how you've changed? That, well, that's, I mean, just having football has helped me in a big way, to be honest. Um, that's you know my love for the game because I think because the the times where I've I've lost people I mean my my, my brother my dad my cousin both nan and granddads people that are close to me you know situations where you don't understand where like people have gone and you can't understand it and you think but why and I think having football where I could sort of like have that switch off where for those ninety minutes or two hours on a training pitch where I'm completely thinking about football and I'm in a change rooms with the lads I'm completely thinking about football and stuff like that. You know, 90 minutes in the game, completely thinking about football. I think sort of like helped me a lot. Obviously, strong family members and friends and stuff like that. But I think for me, I think having football has helped me because, I mean, when I look back and, and yeah, it, you know, there's not a day that, that goes, goes past where I'd, I'd, I'd think about some of the things I've been through. You know, I'd think about my dad. I remember my dad was in, in the hospital um, and I was with him every day and it was leading up to European championships in Poland and Ukraine in 2012 and I was actually in the squad mm -hmm. and it was literally going to training and then Roy Hodgson let me go to the Royal Marsden mm -hmm. in London see my dad spend a couple of hours and going back to the hotel and you know I actually flew to Poland Ukraine and then got a phone call saying my dad passed I came back and I had to go back and I came back from the field and went back so all these sort of things it was tough but again it's just sort of like yeah it changes you as a person because it makes you realise what's important in life and, and, and stuff like that and uh it's sort of like it was it was a real difficult time. But I think, like I said, just, just having football and stuff like that, it helped me. It's it? therapeutic. Yeah, in a bit it helped me in a big way, I think. It would be disrespectful to you not to, to talk about Bradley because yeah, of course. apart from him being special and his yeah. family being special, and apart from um there being a bond that grew up that was incredible. Yeah. Uh, this is my point of view, and you can tell me I'm wrong if you want, but we live in a culture, we live in a, in a country whereby so many people in our public life let us down. And the country is looking for people who, who can be like you were with him because you, you didn't yeah. know the wee fella at all. No. And it was just an instant bond. Yes. You represent, I think, those months and months and months of his happiness, your investment in him, yeah. the things that you allowed him to do and the respect you treated him with and yeah. the, all that kind of stuff. For me, it felt like what we would call British values. And, okay. and some of the warmth that came to you and, and to Bradley was because of that, I think, not just what you did and who he yeah. was. Yeah, because all the negative stuff that's, that was going on. I feel on. that way, do you? I think so, because all the negative stuff that's going on, all of a sudden you see this and, and the football's such a big thing in this country, like massive football. And um, the nation's sort of like, just talked to it. It was just like unbelievable. I mean, at, when I first met Brad, it was just like, um, it was the mascot. And, you know, they told me at the club that, you know, there's a little boy that's not well. Um, you're his favourite player. You know, he's going to walk out of you, stuff like that. But as soon as he walked into the change rooms, it was just like, bang, just that instant connection and his energy and stuff like Exactly, that is energy. And it was just like, wow, because, you know, throughout my career, I've, I've walked out with many mascots. Mm -hmm. You know, I've, I've met loads of kids that are not well and stuff like that. But I don't know, it was something different with Brad's, that, just that connection and the way he used to, I've said it before, the way he used to look at me, it was just like, hmm. you can, you, I, I could see the love in his eyes. It was genuine. It's a really powerful emotion to feel. Yeah, exactly. I knew it was, it was genuine. It was nothing to do with football. It was just me. And, his, and even when I, when I, even to this day, you know, I spend a lot of time with his family, still his mum and dad. Even when Gemma and Carl, they speak about it, she always, she laughs back because she says it's, it's weird though because there'd be times where, He's at hospital or at home, and he's and he's sort of like um, he's, he's in a lot of pain, and he, he literally wouldn't eat all day. 
it was just he wasn't smart, I was just in bed and then as soon as I walk into the room he's just up <laughs> and she used to say to me she, I just can't like just couldn't understand it it was just as soon as he could hear you as soon as he hears your voice where's Jermaine and he's just up and he's happy and it's just like and for me it was just like wow it's such a amazing feeling because of course there's times when I thought but why me though why like, do you know what I mean it was it was just weird and did you feel did you feel that, that it was course. ordained that that because yeah. your belief, you felt this has been given to me. Of course, it's been given to me. God, I, I, my mom's always said, you know, God, he, he brings people into your life for a reason. Mm-hmm. And uh, I mean that, not just what I brought to Bradley's life, but what he brought to my life as well. Because again, around about that time, I don't know. I just, I just felt, I felt different when, when, when I had that connection with him. I just felt, I felt different. You know, um, it's almost like I always look forward to going to see him. I have mm-hmm. that buzz, that feeling in my stomach. You know, after training, I'm going to see Brad's. And it was sort of like, at the beginning, yeah, I knew I was doing something special, but maybe I didn't realise how special it was. Because for me, it was just something, the, the goodness of my heart, I was just like, this is, I just want to see him. It's just, he's, he's a little boy, he's not well. But what um, was generosity became something much yeah, larger that yeah. gave and then the... people started talking about it. Then I started seeing stuff in the paper, social media and stuff like that. And people started sending me nice messages. I can't believe what you're doing for this boy. And I was like, what am I, what, like, what am I doing? Like, um, this is... I want, even if I want a footballer or even if no one knew about it mm-hmm. the same it'd just be exactly the same there's times where I went to the house and see him you know I'd get in bed with him give him a cuddle and stuff like that Did you, you knew though that because you'd been through it so often before yeah. you knew that grief was likely coming of course yeah I knew and you never feared not feared that but you know the, the more you invest even the yeah, happier yeah, yeah. the bigger yeah. you feel you know that uh, at some point uh, it's the inevitable yeah I knew but it was I think it was one of those ones where I need to spend as much time as possible with him because this is what's making him happy and it, and this is what's making me happy. So I just want to spend as much time with him as possible um, and just make sure every day um, that he's smiling. And that's all, that's all it was. Just want, I just wanted to make him happy. That's all I wanted to do. I want a share of, of the glow. I, I'm asking this question because I think I know the answer. How did your mum feel about what you did? My mum? Yeah. It was like... She she was really emotional because she she just said like she just said to me at the end of the day that's where the gift that you've got can 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 it can it's not just about football it can change life and it can you know it's such a big thing um, and it was it was tough for her as well um, she spoke to Gemma and and, and Carl and uh, she st- she still does now um, but she was proud to be honest yeah. she was proud because she said you know what she goes. You didn't really, you, like, you didn't have to do that. No one forced you to do that. You know, there was times where I'd actually go to the house and see Brad's. And, said, no, and she goes, I'm, just, I'm really proud of that. But at the same time, it's, it's special. What you've done is special. And, and she said to me, if you don't, you might not realise now, but trust me, it was, it's, it was special. Um, it was. And um, I don't know, I feel different from when I came in here, here now. There's a sort of glow. Yeah. In here, because it's nice to meet somebody who did that. Yeah. It's good to listen to it. Mm. And it kind of reaffirms your uh, love of football, love of life, and, and respect for you. Jermaine Defoe, thank you very much indeed. This has been a beautiful experience. No problem, thank beautiful you. Beautiful experience. Cheers, I enjoyed that, thank you. That's weird, my mum just. No, me. hey! And then Bradley's mum, Gemma, just messaged me. Oh, the big interview is produced by Backpage and me, Graham Hunter. The music you always hear. The music that you love is Beer Jacket. You can keep up with everything that we do, within reason, by getting on the mailing list at grahamhunter.tv. How many times do I have to tell you? Yes, several thousand of you have done it, but come on, slackers at the back, sign up. That grahamhunter.tv site is also where you can buy the new updated version of my book, Barca, The Making of the Greatest Team in the World. It's my account of the Guardiola era at the camp now from 2008 until 2012 plus Tito, Tata and Adios Johan Cruyff. It is in all good bookshops now but it does also make a big difference to all of us who've worked on the project if you choose to buy direct at grahamhunter.tv forward slash books. You'll be sure to get the new edition and you will be helping us to continue producing independent content. Thanks for listening. Thanks for being there. Without you, this would be fun, but a lot less fun. See you soon.